Um, I'm going to just talk briefly about lessons not learned. Um, uh, governance and in, 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 um, accountability. Um, so the research design, I'm going to breeze through this. I had a purpose of sample of eight camps. Four, at four had an NGO camp management agency and four did not. Um, it was five weeks of research in June and July 2011. We did participant observation, household surveys. We had 791 respondents. Um, we had 88 semi-structured interviews with eight recipients. And then I did interviews with eight workers, 58 of them, from uh, the local to the international level. I did follow-up from January to the summer 2012. Um, and I did eight follow-up visits to the camps. Um, so, um, First one, first lesson to be learned is that Haiti was not built back better. Um, people were moved, uh, we did, a, we did a, a research and found that people moved into lower income neighborhoods than they, when, they, when they were before the earthquake. 56% um, left the camps because of bad conditions. 17% left because they were forced out. 62% report worse economic activity and make less money now than when living in the camps. This was uh, as of uh, the summer of 2012. 53% um, report access to health service was worse now than when living in the camps. 47% uh, report that their access to water is better. 36% worse than before the earthquake. So uh, this, you know, this, uh, this also follows on the heels of a study that was just conducted with uh, uh, Center for Economic Policy and Research last Thursday about the, the ACOM housing to house the Caracol workers. If you haven't done so, please do read that. Uh, there, uh, last Thursday was a really important expose. So the question is why? Uh, why was Haiti not built back better? And so this is what I've been working on as an anthropologist for uh, some time. I do apologize about this photo, but I think it's important to show. Uh, this is a reality of li people living in the camps. Um, this is a picture of a, a Colombi camp um, in outside this, the outskirts of the industrial park. Uh, the NGO that had installed the latrines left and did not, did not deinstall them when their contract expired, so that this was standing for over 10 months in, until they could find another quote unquote actor. So this is a, uh, a prelude to the, the, less, the second lesson. NGOs are private in institutions. So the first question to be asked is, NGOs are accountable to whom? Um, many NGOs do great work. Um, many folks in this room are, do, are working very hard, but the, structurally speaking, NGOs are not accountable to anyone but their donors. And you know, if they have a board of directors, obviously that's their governance structure, but they're not accountable to the local governments in which they're working, and they're not accountable to the beneficiary populations structurally. Um, so then you have things like the, the, the toilet that was left uncleaned uh, and just waiting to, for someone else to pick up for 10 months. Look at the current reward system. So we just heard three good examples of um, uh, projects that, that work because the local initiative was started with local people, the beneficiaries are part of the conversation, that it was part of a larger plan and they worked with the government. So if, if you have a, uh, it, with all due respect to a comment made that Haitians are, are only individualistic, I will say to look at that reward system because the Haitian people also has an immense capacity for collective action and solidarity as well, as does every, every population, every people in the world. So look at the reward system that rewards the kind of behaviors that are individualistic versus collective. Um, and also look at the reward system for NGOs. If they're, if they're like Iteka or like, um, um, like my colleague next to me here, Edgar, uh, if they're working with local populations, they're accountable to that population. Um, they're working with the government, not around the government. So that's a reward structure. Uh, so the picture I showed you was from Camp Colombi. The latrines were abandoned. I also did research in a camp called Karadi. It's a very large camp. Um, former Italian Toto, it's a, a wealthy landowner that was declared a public land in 2003 by the, the, uh, the previous government of Aristide. Um, well, the, you'll see a photo in a moment. What happened was a creation of haves and have-nots. Because one particular NGO was, had a contract for people that were displaced from another camp, San Luis de Gozat. And so they built tea shelters. Uh, in 2011 for people that were displaced from, from the, from the St. Louis camp. And they were surrounded by people that were there since the earthquake. So it, in, the first thing that they did is they built a fence around what was to be the, 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 the new place for the haves. And you know, this was the group of people that got all the lighting, that got all the, 
uh, infrastructural work, etc. Um, did a st study of um, 2010, uh, before and after the cholera outbreak, um, about water and sanitation services. So, um, one of the variables that was the most statistically significant was whether or not a camp was managed by an NGO, which is good. It means NGOs are doing their job. However, camp management agencies were only in 27% of the camps. And that number only went up because other camps were closing. So, um, I went back, this is from the summer, uh, back in January 2011, um, 37, six, so the, the basically um, an increase in 4% of camps that had access to water and an increase in 4% of camps that had access to a toilet. If you look at the percentage, actually, the, the percentage went up because the number of camps went down. There's a couple of cases of camps closing because of the cholera up, epidemic. Um, so. This, you know, what do we need? What, so after $175 million of new aid, there was no progress. And so the question is, you know, why is that? So structurally speaking, it, it's a question about accountability. As private institutions, they're not required to do more than they said they're going to do to their donors. So this is the picture of that camp. Um, the, sorry, the picture's a little off. Um, but in the background, you can see tea shelters. This, uh, this is the area of Caride. And the foreground is the, uh, the, the camps that existed be, before. So this is a border created, a new division between haves and have-nots. And so going back to this camp even today, um, there, are, there's, there are signs of economic activity in the, in the, ha the haves. It's paved, there are cars that are parked, people are, are, are trying to approximate a life. Um, but outside that, uh, people are afraid of being evicted. The third lesson is you know, asking a question of the role of the government. Um, Absolutely, we need to be thinking about elections, and absolutely, we need to be uh, pressuring uh, to make sure that the, the Haitian government is accountable. But my question as an anthropologist is, what do we mean when we say government? If you were to compare, uh, compare the, the situation in the United States, if you were to say that the United States government is only the actions of its Congress, our government would not look as good um, as our local governments. You know, the government shut down last year uh, as an example of, you know, we need to think about different scales. Um, so. Uh, that same statistical survey before and after the, earth, uh, the cholera epidemic, all of the progress was concentrated in Cite Soleil. Why? Because DINEPA, the state agency for water and sanitation, demanded 100% coverage in the camps, and they got it. Um, left to their own devices, NGOs did not add camps, uh, wash services to a single other camp that didn't already have it. Um, another reason is because DINEPA was one of the rare agencies that co-chaired a cluster, the 12 cluster, UN, UN humanitarian clusters after the earthquake. Um, cluster system, by and large, excluded the Haitian government. Linguistically, the language was English during the meetings, um, and also the, it is an, a UN base uh, where access was, you know, very granted by the UN troops. Uh, and so a, a Haitian government official who was very high up within the government was denied access twice. And so I, as a test, did, deliberately did not present my passport just to see if they would let me in, and they did twice. So um, like I said, the language of English. Other, um, so if you look at other examples of ministries that are high functioning, uh, the, ge the gender-based violence cluster, GBV, was co-chaired by the Ministry of Women's Condition, and that's also met outside a log base, and they did uh, a phenomenal job. Um, the Ministry of uh, Public Health and Population also did a good job of coordinating the cholera response. Um, the question is about coordination. Um, everyone talks about the need for coordination, um, but uh, you know, if you have an agency like DINEPA who is under-resourced, it's going to be slower than if you have it coordinated by an agency that has resources. Um, the, the, unit, uh, um, the NGO registry agency, Yuka Ong, um, organized departmental councils that have donors, government officials, and NGOs, part of the same conversation in all 10 departments of the country. Uh, this is this is happening as recent. This is a new motion. Um, it's from what, from all three sectors. It's seeming that people are, are appreciative of this. Um, but the you know, people, uh, the director of Yuka Ong said that only 10 to 20 percent of NGOs ever bothered to send their annual report to the government before the earthquake. Um, municipality matters. Um, there's a, so for example, go back to the the, the camp in Karadu. All of the water stations were on the other side of the road, which was in the Tabar city. This is significant because the Delma uh, mayor was um, a, 
has a, his record is clear about his, his intention to close down the camps if, by force if necessary. So um, local governments do matter a lot. Um, Carrefour, um, it, it, there is a, the land tenure issue is one of the hugest problems uh, when it's all informal and the, the cadast uh, was, was not, well, we've, we've heard this before, but there, there was a success um, story in Carrefour uh, where the mayor um, had a community enumeration, said, have a meeting on this parcel land, who might have any claim to this land, and as a community, they, they unblock the process so that they can get building moving forward. So it was a temporary measure, but it was a community process, a bottom-up process. Um, so that's a lesson to be followed. This is a picture of a protest, um, a demonstration in front of parliament uh, by Fraca in J June 2011. Um, so another lesson uh, is about local participation. What we heard, the success about these events, uh, these housing projects, the, if you look at the cornerstone of the success of those three projects was local participation, local consultation, uh, that local people were given the right to say, here's the kind of housing we want, here's the services we want, and had a, and had a, a dialogue. Um, but by and large, the, 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 response that, the, the response to the earthquake excluded Haitian institutions um, from uh, inst from decision making in an uh, institution. So log base is one. Uh, the CRS, the, the interim commission, uh, there was a, a number of parity, but when there was a cholera outbreak, the meeting that held in Santo Domingo, there was a, a letter from the chair, uh, from one of the representatives of the Haitian delegation that the important decisions were being made before the meetings. Uh, so it was, these were kind of pro forma. Uh, this is all documented. Um, the, the Haitian institutions were excluded from funding. This is from the uh, 2012 report from the, the uh, UN Office of Special Envoy. 1% of the emergency response aid went to the government of Haiti. 10% of the reconstruction aid went to the government of Haiti. 0.6% of money went to Haitian organizations or businesses. Um, aid does not match the local priorities. We asked people what their priorities were. M most, uh, the, the, the biggest response by far was housing, needing housing. Whereas when we asked people what did you receive from the organization, uh, they received a hygiene kit. Uh, we asked them why did the NGO give that aid, less than 5% of uh, people reported that the NGO explained why they gave the aid that they gave. So basically, here's what we have to give you. In one instance, the camp said, we appreciate this very much, but we don't need this, we need something else, and the NGO packed up and left because the population dared to speak up. Um, there's another uh, details about the Iteka case when there, you know, there was some tension within that negotiation process because they're, they're, they're trying to say, no, the community wants justice. The community needs to have a, a decent housing and it, it created a, some tension. Um, so unfortunately, there is a very popular um, discourse about uh, anti-aid discourse in Haiti. People are, are getting frustrated with the system. Um, the fifth lesson is the cost of a top-down approach. Um, there's a phenomenon of a humanitarian gentrification. Um, the, I, I knew of eight NGOs that paid their foreign staff $2,500 a month for their housing allowance. By contrast, my three-bedroom house, uh, my roommate and I pay $300 a month. Um, at at the, the national conference in October 2013, uh, one woman said that the director of her INGO got an $8,000 a year uh, housing stipend, um, a month housing stipend. Um, I was uh, trying to find housing for organizations, uh, for partner organizations. I was in the middle of negotiation, and then the question for the landlord was, is it for you or is it for an organization? Once they found it was for an organization, they doubled their price. Um, so um, what happens is that you know, it's a secondary displacement. Uh, the people that used to live in uh, more well-to-do well neighborhoods are being pushed into mixed neighborhoods or being pushed to popular neighborhoods. Um, the differences between the expat and the Haitian salaries it was, a quite, it was something we need to think about. Um, you know, uh, there's a different, there's a, you know, we could, uh, there's, a, there's a logic for hiring people that, for salaries that are competitive here. But if people are, who are twice their age or a Haitian who have more experience are being managed by a boss that makes 10 times as much as them and they have less capacity, that created a lot of tension within organizations. Um, so the high visibility and temporary solutions are costly. So that if you did the, the math, the average tea shelter cost $4,000. Um, if you're working only with local materials, uh, buying your own um, 
a block was 26 good for a cement block. If you do the calculations, the, to build a house would cost less than $1,000 for typical uh, Haitian construction. Uh, obviously, we need to be, that's, that's only the, the, the physical structure. Um, so the water trucks were, the, um, were sent to camps, whereas, uh, the, the, you know, if, if a question was asked, how did you get your water before the earthquake, you, they would talk about the community taps, the, the, the Dinepa, uh, before, before that it was Kamep. Um, and so the, the, the high cost solution was, was, was done, and it was a temporary solution. These were, these were connect, you know, politically connected. There are three families that, that control most of the private water trucking, whereas a, pu a, a public solution would have been much cheaper and more sustainable. Uh, the tea shelter versus their own housing. I talked about that example. Um, local materials and know-how. I mean, the three positive examples all employ local architects, local engineers, local builders, um, and local managers. And that's, that's one thing that I heard very clearly from the three examples that we just heard. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case for most of the aid that was delivered to Haiti. Um, so what happens is the creation of parallel structures. Um, so NGOs have become, uh, we heard in another panel, they've become a state within a state. I believe that was Milo who said that. Um, there's also cre contributes to a brain drain of the public sector. Um, so it, when you have private hospitals that are paying their doctors five times as much as the state hospital, the, do the doctors are gonna leave the state hospital and work for the private hospital. And when the private hospital leaves, uh, the city of Del Mar is going to be down one hospital. The, the city of Leogan may be down another hospital. Um, so this is a, a, a long-term cost. Uh, this is a picture I took six months after the earthquake. This was supposedly the clinic in Carade, one of the big camps. So the last lesson is about sustainability. Um, why are the high visibility projects done? It's because of the photo op. Because people are, you know, the, if what they hear from our advocacy is only the question, where did the money go? There's a pressure to spend regardless of whether there is long-term impact. So we might have contributed to some of this in our advocacy, but it's the photo op that creates, the, you know, you need to have a picture of 100 people waiting in line, 500 people waiting in line for food or for water, whereas a, a longer-term solution might have been to, uh, to have the Dinupa uh, taps cr uh, done. Or, you know, the building someone a tea shelter, giving them a key, is a photo op, whereas just giving someone the materials to rebuild their own house, you can't really take a photo of that. Um, so the pressure to kick, the photo op is also behind the pressure to kick people out of camps at all costs. Some of which are, you know, based on, you know, giving $500, some of which was out of, you know, after violence. The question is where did people go after they left the camps? Um, people went to Mola Bital, people went to Canera, people went to other camps. The bigger question is we really don't know. 47%, um, almost half of people did not return to the families that they lived with before the earthquake. 32% lived into a different neighborhood, went to a different neighborhood. So their social networks are important. Um, the aid also disrupted family and solidarity networks. Uh, the average family size was 5.37 to the, before the earthquake and 3.36 in the camps, meaning the aid policies reinforced people's decision to split up in order to maximize their food aid. Um, however, this is a long-term uh, effect that we need to be thinking about also the solidarity impact. So there's a yellow t-shirt phenomenon with the, the cash for work. People used to be able to do combit. They used to have neighborhood associations that, that did minor infrastructural repairs. This activity may have been destroyed with the, 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 the top-down way that the aid was delivered. This is a, uh, the dis displacement of the collectivist traditions. Dis I say displacement, not destruction. It may return, but for now, it's a concern. Local capacity is not increased. So they technical know-how about how to do humanitarian re response stayed with the foreign aid workers by and large. There is not a training of local staff to, to replace the, the, the foreign staff. Um, so when you don't have enough to go around, two things are created. There's a munpa, people are giving their own people, and which stokes conflict. So uh, recommendations. So first recommendation is we need new models. So Port-au-Prince, uh, quadrupled in size in two decades following neoliberalism. So if our aid is, is still within the neoliberal paradigm, we're going to be reproducing the same problems. Caracol, uh, uh, Cité Soleil was, was built because of the, 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 the low-wage factory workers right next door. So if we're not rethinking that, what we're going to be doing is replacing, reproducing uh, Cité Soleil. We need to have humanitarian that is, in, that is part of a development and human rights framework, not separate. Um, all aid needs to be having, having inclusion of the population and participation, a real participation like the three examples that we heard. 
Um, we need to remember the Haitian culture and context and not a one size fits all model. We need to change the reward structure. NGOs do exactly what they're told. Uh, if donors are serious about local participation, they can do so. Um, need to change how we contract with agency, we tax aid to support the coordination that we need. Uh, they require submission to local government. And when I say local government, I'm also talking about the AZEC Kazet, local participation plan and accountability to the population. I mean, Haitian people use community radio and they do have numbers you can call, I mean, for, for accountability. Call 411 if you have a problem. I mean, that can work. Um, and also to, to end, to implement the Assessing Progress in Haiti Act. This is a, a, a one step, but it is one step that we can take and it has been passed. Um, so we have some time to implement. Thank you very much.